You are listening to the Depression to Expression podcast, and I'd like to sincerely thank you for taking the time to listen. Seriously. You know, it takes a lot to actually take the time and prioritize and put an effort to bettering ourselves because our lives are so busy. They are. Maybe you're listening to this on the way to work or you're listening to this while doing something else because there doesn't seem to be enough time in the day to get everything we want done. Hands up if you feel that way. Two hands up if you feel that way, except if you're driving. Watch out. Be careful. But seriously, so I'd like to thank you, and I hope this this podcast is useful to you in these discussions, this dialogue and discourse we have is useful because the topics are just going to keep getting better and better. Now, meditation, I have my friend Kayla Kozan on here. She's a meditation master, and she goes to companies around Toronto and now across Canada because she's moving uh, back to Regina, but... But she, she's a meditation master, and when we think of meditation, everyone, we think, okay, you got to find the highest mountain, you got to get in an orange robe, and you got to say, oh, that's not how it works. Sometimes the last thing I want to do is sit down and meditate after I've been sitting for a while. So we're going to talk about all types of different meditations in this podcast. Kayla's actually going to do a guided meditation for us, and of course, we're going to have some laughs and tell some jokes, and, and meanwhile... Kayla's going to share her experience with bipolar disorder. But we have fun with these things. I don't want these podcasts to bring you down. Life is full of tragedy, my friend, and it is the hardest thing, and it's beyond comprehension how difficult it's been for many of us and continues to be. But I hope this podcast is a guiding light and shares some new perspectives and new techniques to add to your mental health toolbox. That's what this is all about. All right? Now, I know it's hard for us to find time. To meditate. But that's why I think this podcast will be useful to you, this episode, because there are really easy ways to do things that don't take a lot of time. Now, the one thing I mention here in this episode is okay, let me let me break this down for you. Let me hey, I got the mic here. Kayla's not here just yet, so let me let me just share a few things with you. All right, so I've been making YouTube videos for about seven years now, right? 20 million people have watched my videos. That's pretty cool for a guy that talks about depression and anxiety and doesn't do makeup tutorials and gaming videos. Pretty good, right? Because that's what a lot of YouTube is today. Not bad. So obviously there's a thirst for this kind of thing. So over these past seven years, I've received thousands and thousands and thousands of emails from people. And I have a pretty good data set on certain themes that come up all the time. This is what I share with parents during parent groups. I did a parent group talk on social media, internet safety, and mental health last night. It was fantastic. And these kids are emailing me instead of talking to their parents about their mental health situation. That's a whole other podcast and topic. But why are people finding it so difficult to find time to better their own mental health? Because that's the excuse I hear a lot. That's a big theme in a lot of emails. Scott, I'm a working professional. Scott, I'm a parent. Scott, I'm a student. I don't have time. And I just like to call BS on that. With all due sympathy and respect, there's always time, my friends. If you don't have five minutes to sit down or five minutes to do our walking meditation, five minutes to sit and notice what's happening around you, we, we better check ourselves and reprioritize what we value and pay attention to in our lives. I know. It hurts, doesn't it? I don't mean to come down on you. But this is what's at stake here. What are you prioritizing in your life that's taking over your own well-being? Is that that you don't have time? Because whenever someone says to me, Scott, I'm just so busy. Sorry, I didn't respond to your text. I've just been swamped. I've been so busy. Really? In 2020, with the technology we have, you couldn't find 15 seconds to send a text? I don't believe it. I'm sorry. I don't believe it. Come on. It's not about not having the time. It's not prioritizing effectively. That's what it's all about. And we're going to talk about that in this podcast. But we all have five minutes. We can all make five minutes. We can all find five minutes to do this. I don't want to hear excuses anymore. I don't. Seven years of excuses. I've been hearing this stuff over and over. We need to shut our minds off 
because it's always going to come up with excuses. Oh, I'd rather do this instead. Oh, you know what? I can get a head start on this if I save the five minutes here. No, it's time to shut off the brain. It's time to just do it, my friends. Nike coined that baby in the 80s, and you know what? It rings true today. Let's just do it. Be a human guinea pig. Try meditation. I've been meditating since 2008, and I'm still not great. There is still practice to be done. Start with 15 seconds. Start with 20 seconds. Then next month, move to 30 seconds. We can all do it. I have faith in all of you, and I love you all tremendously, but come on. I'm not feeling the busy excuse anymore. It's over. It's over. Let's move on. You owe yourself more than that. Give yourself more credit. Come on now. Now, either you're mad by hearing this, or you're smiling, or maybe you've come to the realization, Scott's right. I can make the time. I will better myself, and I'm going to try this meditation thing no matter what. That's right, you will, my friend, because you're an awesome human being, and human beings hate change, but we adapt, and we can do this together. So who's with me? And silence in the crowd. You got this. Now, we're, I'm going to introduce Kayla here. We're going to have an awesome conversation. And again, my sincere thanks for you taking the time to learn a little bit about meditation and my friend Kayla. Now, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. If you're not new, welcome back. But there's some funky links in the description. If you want to go to my website, depression2expression.com, and see what I do for corporations and schools with speaking about mental health, that would be awesome. You know, yesterday was a big day. I did three schools and... Um, and I, I went to a company downtown, and it was a beautiful boardroom setting, and everyone was so involved and eager to learn about this whole mental health thing. So let's demystify it together. If you're interested in bringing me to your, your company, your school, let me know. I'm just an email and a click away. Technology is pretty cool, right? All right, I'm done ranting. I'm done chatting. Here's my friend Kayla. Talk to you all soon in three, two, one. Kayla, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. For those listening, she is actually here in my studio, aka 400 square foot condo. <laughs> but you comfy? Yes. We have a con uh, condo. We have a coffee. We're we're sitting with our pillows behind us. Excellent posture you have. Thank you. Even though the couch kind of makes your body sink a little bit, it's it's still good. I can tell you're a meditation teacher and coach. <laughs> the, the legs are crossed. Okay, so listen, why don't you let the audience know a little bit about yourself. Let's start with you actually wanting to move back to Edmonton. You've been in Toronto for six years. Let's talk about the importance of family and everyone listening. We're going to talk about meditation as well. Let's get to know Kayla a little bit though. Okay, so I'm actually moving to Regina, which is where my family is. So similar so similar still in the prairies you were close um but yeah i've been living in toronto now for six years and at the end of the month i'm moving back to regina all my friends are there all my family's there um that's where i grew up until i went away for school so it's really bittersweet like as much as i felt the homesick for home now i'm gonna move home it's like now i'm gonna have a different type of homesick for here missing you know my friends right you've made so many connections in toronto but you, obviously you'll still keep in touch and everything but it doesn't feel like there's more of a gain than a loss though moving back home like there's definitely a, a pull factor more than a push factor to get out of toronto or the things you don't like about toronto being here um there's got to be something about toronto you don't like yeah, it's just so different. I, when you're talking, I was nodding and I realized people can't see me nodding. Um, yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> the family part was a really big part. Um, you know, just spending time away was seemed to be getting harder and harder, even though like going away for school, I think the difference was there was a deadline. So it's like you go for school, you know, you're going for two years. Then once you graduate, and you get into your real life. It's like you're in charge of that now, which yeah. gets scary and so I do think it's the right decision it's still a very difficult decision but like you said we're still only a few provinces away and like I'll be here for work and business and weddings and everything so right it is it's interesting how responsibility is a scary thing terrifying <laughs> I know right <laughs> like why do you think being a kid was so fun it's because you want a sandwich you just have to ask for a sandwich 
If I want a sandwich today, either I got to make it myself <laughs> or ask someone to make it for me and pay them. Gosh, life's hard when you get older. Totally. Like, I would like to know your experience with this, too. Like, how do you, you know, you're around our age. How do you decide where to live? That's such a good question. Um, we were talking about this before we turned on the mics. It's like people, you see these Facebook ads, and I don't know if since you're a quote unquote entrepreneur, I don't like that word. Do you like, <laughs> do you introduce yourself as an entrepreneur? Never. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but I'm sure you see ads where people are like, hey, I'm at the beach, I'm an entrepreneur, I make 60K a day, and you know, do you want this financial freedom? Well, click the link below. And you see all this like, oh, I can work remotely. It's so great having your own business. And then I'm like, yeah, you could live somewhere else. But as you've been in Toronto, too, and being away from family, I think the novelty would wear off for me. It's like during Christmas, during holidays, during weekends, and you just want to be able to have that freedom to see your mom and dad, brothers, sisters. And I think it would wear off. I always think it's not where you live. It's who who you're with, right? Absolutely. And, And have you found that like, being away from home it's it's more important to be with the people that you want to be with rather than being in a in a nice new city yeah absolutely i see those ads all the time and it's like be a digital nomad like run your business for anywhere and i agree like sometimes i see it and they're like on a beach in thailand and you're like that would be awesome like especially in the dead of winter here but it's still very isolating, especially when you're a company of one, when you're first starting out, you're still by yourself. You might be on a beach in Thailand, but you're still by yourself. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it is, there's something to be said for sure for me in terms of like actually just going to my parents' house for supper on like a Sunday night where it's like I Skype them every week, but it's not the same. Mm-hmm. And it is like a bit of a, I was talking to someone about this the other day it's a bit of a novelty anytime I go home like it's like Christmas or it's some sort of holiday so it's like it's not normal like it's not the feeling I think I'll feel once I can just go to my parents place like whenever Mm. I want um and so I think seeking kind of that you know just more of a normal (laughs) relationship that's not so long distance with my family and friends yeah you shouldn't have to feel like a guest Totally. When you're kind of going there for Christmas or holidays, right? It should be like the pop-in kind of mentality for family. Um, let's talk about, well, quote-unquote entrepreneurship. <laughs> so you started Peak Wellness as a meditation teacher, coach. But you first, before that, you were trying stand-up comedy. <laughs> is that, is that... I was scared this was going to come up. <laughs> um let's yeah, talk okay true. it's true so i was doing it basically just as a um hobby so i'm not sure how far back you want me to start but um just going through a diagnosis with my own mental illness i was off work for about a year and in that time i watched so much comedy like all the time like i think there's something very like therapeutic about it and even when i couldn't make myself laugh at all it was still like something there's something about comedy at least for me uh, and so then when i did get back to work full time i took a class at second city that was called like creative writing like sketch writing like kind of like saturday night live and i was objectively bad at it like every person in the class and the teacher was like um this is maybe like not your strength <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, but I did teach. meet someone in that class who had done the stand-up comedy class. She highly recommended it. I tried it out. I absolutely loved it. It's a really good outlet, I think. And another thing that I think is a benefit of comedy, especially if you're someone who's in your head a lot, is you're if you're trying to think of jokes, I think you see the world in like a very funny and like positive way. So even when bad things happen to you, you can like kind of like turn it into something that's funny or it gives you this weird perspective and I think I really really benefited from that especially when I was just getting back to work I'm super rusty I haven't done it in a while but I try to be funny in some of my workshops I have like a 50 50 hit rate sometimes (laughs) it goes really well and other times I just 
pretend it wasn't a joke and I just keep going. Oh, that's so <laughs> good. There are ways to get around that with a tough audience. But as, as so you go into businesses um, and, and do like meditation workshops and courses and lunch and learns and all types of things, which is so crucial for business and at home and at school, like the mindfulness movement, uh, being present. Everyone wants it. A lot of people don't want to put the put the work and time into it. But when you're if, if you're trying to put in a sense of humor into your workshops, are people expecting you to come in and be very zen and very calm? Is that the is that the type of persona that you display when you go into these to do these workshops? I think some people might expect that. I think there's such a wide range that people don't even know what to expect. And probably their closest comparison is any other like corporate wellness training they've had. Even if that was like safety in the workplace or if it was something closer aligned like uh, nutrition or emotional intelligence, like there's tons and tons of workshops. So I think people expect it to be like that. On average, we do try and keep it like lighter and um, more engaging. We have a lot of conversations and stuff just to, it's a serious topic, especially when you delve into mental health. So to keep it more, I think, approachable and lightweight, that's kind of a strategy that we try and use. Um, But yeah, it's hard to say. I think people come into it with really different expectations all the time. Like it's just, it's a practice that has so many different variations that I think people are always kind of, they're doing their best guess as to what it is, but it, they don't have much of a framework, especially if they've never meditated before. Mm-hmm. Have, how long have you been practicing meditation for? So that's something I usually say when I open the workshops too, because, um, or any keynote, like I know there's people in the room that are skeptical. Maybe they didn't even want to come to this session. And so when I open, I do say this is something that I only started practicing mindfulness after um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and that was a supplementary treatment. And even then, that was recommended to me by, by like five professionals before I started, like really was like, okay, I'll give this a shot. So I was as much of a skeptic as I think some people in the audience might be. Um, but to answer your question, that would have been, yeah, right when I was coming through a diagnosis, which was about six years ago now. No kidding. Okay, mm. so that's a that's a good amount of time. So what have you noticed dealing with bipolar disorder and and recovering from this mental these mental health issues? How has meditation played a role in that recovery? Yeah, so the hardest part for me um, with bipolar disorder was getting out of the depression. So that was kind of what I experienced second. So the mania was its own little beast, but um, I started meditation when I was kind of in the depression phase. I know this is something you've talked about a lot as well. And I think um, maybe you can relate to when you're in that place, you are so willing to try anything. You so desperately just want to be out of that state that even if something, you know, it seems a little woo-woo to you or whatever, you're willing to try it um, just to help get you out of that spot. And so my first introduction was actually a formal course that's called MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. So probably your audience is familiar with CBT as well, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, So this is that idea with an element of mindfulness. And what I would say is that practice helped me to learn how to manage my moods um, and maybe to not feel like I was at like the mercy of my mental illness or what happened to me and added a little bit of a buffer so I felt like I had more control. Probably if there's one thing I could say that was, yeah, easier, made things easier early on was just a very short, small practice that would help me to feel like I was back in control of the situation when things were really starting to kind of spiral managing emotions like when you were in a a depressed state all you wanted to do is is obviously get out of that meditation wasn't necessarily a tool to get you out wasn't it more of a tool at least in my experience more of a tool to almost go deeper into it yeah that's an interesting distinction i think you're right you are looking for maybe it's even better to say for myself i was looking for control i felt like i Mm. was like 
at the mercy of this mental illness and especially in kind of like the trenches of depression when you just feel like you're not in control anymore. As much as you want to feel, you can um, kind of always think like you can act the way that you want to feel. I know that's often like um, a technique that's taught to people and maybe mindfulness helped me do that. It helped me get control back. I think that's probably a good way to put it. I love that. I love that. What are some of the things as as you teach meditation and even in your own experience, um, what are some of the roadblocks you find people people talking about when trying meditation or why why they don't continue the practice? What are some roadblocks? Yeah, that's a great question. I know. It's such a good question. <laughs> great interviewer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is really, really um, something that we focus on a lot when we go into organizations, Mm -hmm. but I think this uh, applies to any individual, especially as we're kind of learning more and more about mindfulness and meditation now. I think a good analogy is kind of the idea of exercise. So as this research is coming out, you know, everybody knows that you should exercise. That's pretty, we pretty much all agree on that, but there's tons of different exercise you can do you can do your like 10 minute thing in the morning or you can be a marathon runner or you could go to the gym six days a week so i think what happens with meditation is there is a type of meditation for everyone i truly believe that if something doesn't work for you there's another methodology you can try or even just different um structures you can put in place to help you Mm. um but i think what people run into a lot is they think there's only like one way to do it so it's as if somebody told you you know you should be exercising and the only people the only reference point you have for that is like doing a full marathon and you're like i can't do that that's not for me and i think what that looks like in meditation is people say oh you should definitely start meditating but people think they have to meditate for 40 minutes a day and they're like, I don't, I don't have the time. I can't sit still for that long. Um, those are big barriers. And so I think the roadblock is a lot of um, misconceptions about mindfulness. And so what we always, always say is to start small. So we start, when we go into an organization, we just ask that they try for five minutes a day for the next five days and just kind of notice and see if they have any changes. Hmm. Because if we do a meditation um, at the office, it's almost like if you did a spin class like one time, like you're going to feel benefits immediately. There's things that are going to, we know that it affects some biomarkers of stress immediately, but you're not going to have any habit built or any long-term practice just from doing that. So that's why we kind of say start small. I think people feel like another roadblock is they need to have this big elaborate practice. Um... And because it seems like something they need to devote so much time to, they just don't start, Hmm. which is where we usually say like a short practice today is better than a long practice you never get to. Um, So those are the biggest things, I think, people not having, feeling like they don't have enough time. And then one other thing I would add is people, sometimes I think people feel like they want to figure out what the best type of meditation is before they start. So um, people with maybe personalities like um, I can relate to this and maybe you can as well when you're looking to kind of optimize your time and so you're like okay if I only have five or ten minutes a day I have to do the best type of meditation like the best version but that's kind of an unending pursuit if you're going to try and figure out what the best one is mm. so that's why we usually just say just try something try it for a couple of days if that style doesn't work for you try something else but again just get started just get started. Start small. Totally. Um, like, have you ever met people who can't even find the five minutes? Mm-hmm. I've even had, why don't you just take 10 seconds just to look around, notice your body, notice your breathing. Just like, what is your, what do your fingers feel like on the keyboard? What does your ear feel like when you, when you put the phone to it? Just like these very basic things that we don't notice through our day to day. Um, that could is that somewhere you start to something like super super basic a hundred percent so yeah we talked about that um people will say they don't have five minutes and i totally understand people especially if they're working come on you you can be honest on this podcast (laughs) no if someone says they don't have five minutes they don't have a life come on let's be honest i disagree i think oh let's fight okay here we go here we go (laughs) Sorry, what I think they what I think they mean when they say that, not literally I don't have five minutes, is yeah. I haven't prioritized 
I don't have five minutes to put towards this. Right. So, you know, you're spending a long day at work, you have kids, you get out of the shower, you don't have a moment to yourself, which is then we do kind of peel it back to something more simple, which is, and in the kind of area of, um, you know, psychology and setting habits, we consider something like habit stacking. I don't know if you've like heard of this before, but basically Mm -hmm. just adding your mindfulness onto something you already do today, regardless. Right. Brushing your teeth and showering are like our classic go-tos because they are very like sensation based, but usually we're not even in the same room when we're doing that. Um, Sometimes we'll say like, who are you in the shower with? Like, even though you're showering alone, are you already thinking of your boss and the meeting you have and you're, you know, you're not even in the same place. And so that's where if people say they can't find five, five minutes, um, we suggest habit stacking. So trying to be mindful while you're brushing your teeth or showering or the other thing a lot of people um, benefits a lot of people that I don't think many people know about is there's lots of meditations you can do with your eyes open walking around. So mm-hmm. walking meditations, even commuting meditations, like you're on the subway, um, Ton, there's just so much out there but I think yeah the idea that you need to sit down for 20 minutes every day is a big barrier for people right and I think that's one thing that's that's maybe advertised a lot is that kind of meditation whereas the one you know habit stacking yes being in the shower being mindful of of sensation what are you seeing what are you hearing what are you smelling um, a lot of people myself included you you go in the shower you wash your hair two minutes later, you're like, did I shampoo? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, so that a is lot. a perfect example of you like just being outside of your body and the moment completely. And I could definitely empathize with people because there's so much to do during the day. There's there's so many things that you need to plan for throughout the day before you even get to work. If we calculate what a work day is, there's no way it's eight hours based on cognitive function and totally. we're thinking about work. How often we're thinking about it, it's like from the moment we wake up yeah. to the moment we go to bed. Um, it's taxing for, for mental health. So I think meditation is a, a huge tool for people to almost es- not escape the thoughts, but again, come to notice your environment a little bit more. Um, what are some some practices that you do to pe- for people to kind of get into the moment while you're teaching? Do you focus on the breath? Do you focus on the body? What are some things you do? So if it's our first session with an organization, we do start super basic. So we'll usually open with a breathing um, or like tension holding exercise for, I'm talking like two or three minutes, like super, super short. And what is tension holding for listeners? Um, Yeah. So that would just be like, we carry a lot of tension in our bodies um, without realizing it. So a tension holding exercise helps you to it's almost like creating artificial tension so you can release the actual tension. So it would be something just like scrunching up your toes inside your shoes and like holding that as tight as you can for three breaths. So we'll do that. We'll move up the body, focus on the fists, hold fists for three seconds. We'll bring our shoulders up to our ears as high as we can. And then you can also scrunch your face and just holding those for like three to five breaths each. Then at the end, we combine the whole thing. So It's like scrunching your toes, making the fish, shoulders up to your ears, scrunching up your face as much as you can and just feeling what it feels like to sit in that tension that's a little longer, maybe five, seven breaths, and then we just let people let it go. And that time when they exhale, we encourage them to just be like, and Mm -hmm. just like let it go. And so I think people realize or they don't realize how much tension they're just naturally holding especially at work and especially like in your shoulders and neck so that just helps people like arrive in the room and just let a little bit of that like physical tension go right and for those listening right now uh why don't you all notice your shoulders right now and see if you can drop them a bit because at times especially on a computer on a keyboard oh yeah you can spend the whole day with your with your shoulders to your ears until you notice it And you're like, oh, like I've been, you know, scrunched up so high for hours until you notice the body. So that's a great intro. Um, As far as, again, your own personal meditation and rituals and habits, do you meditate every day? Do you have a rigorous, a rigorous morning routine or do you meditate in the evening? What's, what's your, what's your daily routine like in that sense? Yeah, so I get asked this a lot, and I think I get asked this also from people who 
even if they're in the audience at a talk, often those people meditate more than I do. So that is something too that um, we usually say is I clock, I would say 20 minutes of meditation a day on average, but there's days that it's way less. So I'll wake up in the morning. That's an easy time for me personally to do kind of, let's say five to seven minutes. I also like guided meditations. Um, I think a lot of people in this space, uh, you know, they're not, they don't want to do guided meditations themselves. Like perhaps they just want to do their own breathing practice or their own guided, but I definitely benefit from guided personally. And then before bed, I'll always usually try and do a body scan, which can kind of be, you know, whatever I feel like I need. Like sometimes it's three minutes. I know I'm going to fall asleep anyways. And then sometimes if I'm wide awake or kind of riled up before bed that's more like 15 minutes Hmm. um but another thing too i think you alluded to it is just trying to be mindful during the day and just what that actually looks like and so i think people can really find a lot of benefit from that even if they don't clock any formal guided meditation minutes a day right and you know Something I've noticed, we were talking before about getting older. Like, <laughs> everyone, Kayla's like, I don't want to say I'm getting older, but I'm getting older. <laughs> and it's like, wait, I'm 30. How old are you? 28. Oh, what the? Oh, you're Okay, ancient. so, yeah, oh, I am. Know. Oh, my God. Time's a ticking. <laughs> but literally, I think about this. I thought about this at work when I was working at advertising. I just felt like time is slipping through my fingers yeah. you know our parents are always like well when you get older time goes by faster yeah. i'm like mom whatever let me eat my dunkaroos and just go to school we could not we never got dunkaroos but but now as i'm getting older i'm like mom was right yeah. time goes by so quickly day after day i'm like the week's gone yeah. it's already almost the end of january like it's where terrifying. is time going and i think with mindful practices it's for me personally it just helps the feeling that you're soaking in the moment and your time during the day even if you have the same routine every day to notice something else you can you can have the same commute for 50 years and you can notice something different every single day on your commute it doesn't matter if it's an unwashed window on a building a different kind of car like new roads new trees that you haven't noticed new colors but for me personally the the antidote for time slipping through my fingers if anyone can resonate with that let us know but the antidote to that was like having these mindful moments during the day and not just get through work to get through work but to actually appreciate the time and to literally sit Mm -hmm. notice what i'm doing Mm -hmm. know the time not just thinking of what i have to, to to do tomorrow but to actually focus on the task at hand I think it's better for for building memories, at least, to look back on, right? Absolutely. I actually saw one of our facilitators um, posted something on Instagram the other day, and it was like uh, something along the lines of, you know, we spend so much time working towards extending our lives. So, you know, as long as you eat this diet, you can live two years longer or five years longer. But the easiest way to dramatically expand our lifetime is to be in it while we're going through it so okay you can add on like two five seven years of your life by doing all these things but if you're never living in the moment it doesn't matter right yeah it's so a if you constant. enjoy kind of like moment by moment that's actually the easiest way to expand your lifestyle your life your enjoyment of life i think you're absolutely right no that's great do you think People are, because it's constantly, okay, I'm going to meditate for the benefits. I'm going to meditate because I heard it reduces stress and I'll be more focused and this and this. I think we're in in such a culture where you're constantly looking for a positive exchange for new activities rather than just experiencing the activity with no expectation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, I'll admit it, the reason I started meditation in 2008 was for depression and anxiety but and I was so focused on the benefits of what it was giving me but years later I started to focus on what it was giving me like in the moment to take the time rather than the result of how I'm going to feel through the day is that something that you you kind of believe in a different kind of educational piece 
Yeah, for sure. I think it, we have a tendency, and I see it in myself too, you know, you put your head down and you're working so that you can get the results. Like, I'm going to do A so that I can get B. I think a good analogy as well is like going to the gym. So if when you go to the gym, you just, you know, run as hard as you can for 20 minutes and get out of there. And your goal is just for weight loss, like four months from now. It's like when you're at the gym, it's you're not actually really experiencing it. You're just doing it so that you can get somewhere, hopefully later on. Mm. Where I've actually, people have told me that the gym is like an extremely mindful time for them. That's actually a way that they meditate if they're lifting weights or if they get into some sort of like kind of flow state. And so I think if your your goal is, you know, I need to do this so that I can lose weight or I can be able to run this marathon, you might be missing some of the point and also the benefits of when you're actually working out. Hmm. So I think that's a it, totally, we're so goal oriented that maybe we're missing the experience of prepping and per, the pursuit of that goal. Right. Just to do it for the sake of doing it and being there. I've heard that a lot. That's that's kind of my gym routine. Are you a person that goes to the gym and socializes or do you kind of get get the work done and kind of that's your moment to be with yourself? Yeah, I would say I'm, pre- I'm more in my head than socializing. Um, I don't socialize that much. Sometimes they'll <laughs> be asking people like <laughs> at the end of the class, um, they'll be like, you know, do you guys have plans this weekend? I was saying to my friend the other day, like I, I could be getting married the next day. And if they asked that, I'd be like, no, nothing, (laughs) (laughs) nothing big. Like I don't, I don't socialize in those situations. Really? Are you one to volunteer information or does someone have to ask you a question in order to get something from you? I think at the gym, you would have to ask me a question like over and over 10 times. (laughs) I think, yeah, that's just not a, it's a place for me that I do really get in my head. And I personally feel a lot of benefits, especially um, running or do any work with weights. Like I feel really connected with my body and I'm definitely in my own head, not like the fun person at the gym. Right, right, exactly. (laughs) But that's like huge for any kind of exercise. I want to get back into rock climbing because rock climbing is you are so in the moment because you're up on a wall and if you miss the next hold, you fall. And of course, you have these these ropes and you're not actually going to fall to die. your death. Yeah. <laughs> but even even bouldering, you're still yeah. up. Like you're still going to fall. Um, so to have that complete focus and being be in flow state, if you're doing something with the body like that, that's massive. That's why sports are so popular. And for people that even watch them too. Totally. Where there's kind of that that escape is there some guilty pleasure that you have for escaping the tedium of day-to-day life um i get a i find (laughs) online shopping bizarrely (laughs) comforting to me like even when i'm not buying things no way oh yeah just to add to cart and just let it sit there yeah like i don't know what it is about (laughs) i'm sure you would know more about this like technology addiction and whatever's going, the serotonin in my brain that it like kicks off. But I do find that (laughs) oddly comforting. I've heard people say similar things. Um, Someone in a workshop said, you know, shopping is really mindful for them. And I was like, I can't tell you you're wrong. Like if that works for you, that gets you out of autopilot. That's something that, you know, helps you calm your mind and your thoughts. Uh, Gaming I've heard a lot is like very comforting for people or... Yeah, maybe helps them get out of their head. Mm -hmm. The exercise is super interesting. Another one that people, um, this is kind of for someone who doesn't have five minutes. I guess it's more for people. Another thing people will say is they literally cannot calm their mind. So they think they're failing. So when I meditate, I cannot calm my mind. So there's just, I can't do it. Those are the people where they benefit a lot from something like swimming. Something where... You can think about anything else except not drowning. Yes, right, right, right. Yeah, give them no choice. You can't worry while you're swimming. You can't like think about an upcoming presentation or what your boss said. Like that is something I think where in line with kind of the flow state, that is a way to calm that crazy spinning monkey mind for people who feel like they can't do it any other way. That's great. And I think that's so... You know, we're, we're at our desks, most of our jobs. Let's look at the window. 
and see all these buildings here and it fascinates me when I walk downtown and you look up at at these buildings and you can see through and everyone's at the desk and they have their yep. own cubicle and chairs. What a what a new way to work. Like this didn't exist years ago where everyone had their own screen and their own computer. Like technology has created just these millions and millions of jobs. That's a whole other podcast. But <laughs> But I feel like if, if people are looking to meditate, sometimes the last thing I want to do is sit again. I've been yep. sitting all day. Mm-hmm. I don't want to sit again and and be mindful this time. So I think that that walking meditation, mm-hmm. mindful walking, mindful moving, um, as you said, like playing video games is huge for people. Shopping, gosh, that would not work for me. <laughs> no way. In you a mall, just, I'm like, just scrolling, like... scrolling like on your phone? No, absolutely not. Wow. It depends if it's like electronics or something like that. But shopping, like clothes shopping. Yeah. Right when I go into a mall, I'm just like, hey, what do I need to do to get out of here <laughs> as fast as possible? What do I do? I need to have like a tantrum. Do I need to spill a drink? Like, what do I need to do to leave as soon as possible? <laughs> <laughs> but but I think like um, having that kind of stimuli where you're more focused. So gaming, just like colors and sounds mm-hmm. and shopping. I don't know. You're paying attention to the fit and the color and how it looks and and the combinations. I don't know how shopping works, but you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> the the, getting your, the, the combinations of things. Yeah. The, you know, combination trend, shopping. Combination. <laughs> <laughs> You've never been combination shopping? Gosh, what a noob. But I think it's important for people to realize, like, to access that maybe creative side, too, is very, Mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, Can I tell you one more that I hear a lot? Yes. Um, This is your podcast, not mine. (laughs) You're the guest. this is, like, it makes sense to me. Um, I would have never thought of it, but so many people say it, is cleaning. So I think it's, like, there's a dual benefit. You know, you can... You're cleaning, so you have something that's like kind of taking your mind away. You're focused on doing a task, and then you also benefit from you know a clean place or an organized place, which mm. is maybe benefits your mental health. But the number of people who are like vacuuming is so calming for me. Like making the lines and like it's almost like a hobby. It comes up more than other hobbies. <laughs> so I think there's like Kayla, you just vacuumed an hour ago. Yeah, but I need another mindful <laughs> I'm moment. <stressed>. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do the lines horizontally this time, you see? People like it. It's Yeah. And it makes sense to me. No, that's so... I completely agree. Vacuuming, awesome. Uh, For me, it was like cutting grass. Mm -hmm. So you get those lines. And I think what people are missing today at work, um, especially this is how I felt, is you're not getting a beautiful reward of accomplishing something that you can see tangibly anymore so even if you were to do like i would do like a presentation and i'd finish like a keynote yeah it's on a screen it doesn't feel good when Mm -hmm. it's complete you can't see the real difference from when you started to when you finished just because it's so digital but with cutting grass or vacuuming or cleaning you see okay it was messy before there was sauce on the oven there was salt over here spilt there was dirty dishes and now 20 minutes later of putting in physical effort Now I see a difference in my immediate environment. I think that's a powerful reward. Whereas it's such a, um, like the digital experience of having this reward is just not, it's such an imitation of that kind of reward in the physical quote unquote world. Um, Which is why I understand, yes, the vacuuming, the reward of, geez, even working out, you talk, you hear people getting their pump on. (laughs) Getting, getting pumped, right? Getting swole. Right. It's like, okay, I before I worked out, this is how I looked. And now after, my biceps are a little bigger. Cool. And I can see <laughs> veins now. But seriously, it's like something existing in the physical world that wasn't yeah. there before or it looks different. That's huge. I totally agree. I think we are really separated from that now in most knowledge work or work that you're doing in an office. Like, I remember talking to a friend about this. It was probably on, like, How It's Made or some sort of little show. This guy was talking about it takes him, like, six months to make a violin. So he, whatever all those steps are, like, finding the wood, polishing it, all the, takes him, like, six months. So let's say every year he's cranking out two of these super, super high-end violins. I just think there would be 
so much joy in like starting and creating that and the fact that you did that with your own hands like Mm. there's something about that i think you know using your hands like you said starting and finishing like you once you've completed it's completed i think a lot of people don't get that in an office setting Mm. you know you crank out one report but like it's ongoing or you did a report or some reporting and you pass it on to someone else so the working with your hands isn't there working kind of in like a more outdoorsy um setting isn't there and a lot of people which i think is a really 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 big issue in offices is people don't see where their work goes or their effort goes it kind of just evaporates so you know you work so hard on this presentation and then you hand that presentation off to your manager and now you start something else and I think the separation between uh what you've done and what you've worked on and that reward and you know starting and finishing something is really lacking in a lot of workplaces Mm, that's such a good point the to-do list is a very addicting thing because there is a dopamine hit when you cross Mm -hmm. that that off and you check it off cross it off and it's not there anymore it feels good to accomplish things but that's like such a short-term goal every day that we have our Mm -hmm. to-do list of 10 things and you check it off it feels good but when you feel like that that time slipping through your fingers, like there's no accomplishment and the the efforts don't match the rewards, I think we need to look at more long term goals that we're achieving along the way, that we're getting closer to, that we're chasing something. The violin, for example, the person has things to do on the violin every single day, but the the outcome is the entire violin that will be mm-hmm. in front of you at the end of the project. You see you. I've been to Europe a bunch of times and you see like the churches and you go to the Sistine Chapel. Mm -hmm. It's like, what did the Sistine, how long did it take Michelangelo, Michelangelo to paint? Wasn't it like 13 years? He's like, he, hey Google, how long did it take Michelangelo, Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel? Four years. Four years. WebsiteStudy.com, they say. It took Michelangelo four years to paint the frescoed ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Four years working every single day. On one thing. On one thing. We don't get that anymore because it's so easy to get things now. Like we have computers in our pockets and all we had to do is go to the Apple store and just swipe a card. It's so easy to obtain things now, but to make something from scratch is not as hideous as it kind of is. I made that TV stand. But it felt really okay. good. Yeah. It felt really good to make that. That's not bad. For those picturing what it looks like listening, it's not made with like just two by fours and nails. No, it's very nice. Oh, thank you. It, but it was stained and it was put together and those are actual like oak floorboards that I use and then you did the perimeter here and... You're going to have to post a picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but is there something that you do rather other than like vacuuming, but some like some goal that keeps you going a long-term goal or something that you're working towards in a bigger sense yeah I mean I feel like I do miss that just that something physical and something with my hands obviously this business is my sole focus right now so that is I guess like one project but it's ongoing and it's so so complex like it's not like building something and you had it now you finish it and so I'm not sure if you feel the same way with your business it's your sole focus um but I I do think it's there's value in having some sort of hobby or at least side project that you start and finish and when it's finished it's finished it's not just ongoing forever right right what do you what's the hardest part of that was her phone not mine (laughs) everyone no way was it I think that was you. Really? Mm-hmm. That is unbelievably wow. rude. Not, <laughs> a, not as rude as you showing up a half hour late, but... Uh, <laughs> People are going to think that's true. What, it, wasn't it true? Weren't you no. here late? You were here pretty late. I was here four minutes late. Really? Mm-hmm. You were here at 1034. Mm-hmm. Really? How do we prove that, though? Check your phone in the buzzer. Shoot, that's a good point. Okay, she was here on time, everyone. Don't <laughs> don't hold me to that. Don't hold me to that. Um As far as running peak wellness, okay, uh, contacting working professionals, getting into businesses to do these awesome workshops that are so vital for the workplace at home, at school, 
what what are some challenges with with running a business for those of those of you who are I'm not going to keep saying entrepreneurs but business owners let let them in a little bit what's difficult about running your own running your own business yeah it's it's so so different than like my job um, <laughs> like when i had an office job um and i think we've talked about this before too especially with you working more so, I mean, a little, we overlap a lot, but I would say you work more with schools. And <laughs> I remember we were talking about just business development and like continually finding those customers and reaching out to people. It just goes on forever. And there's so much rejection, like <laughs> more than I have. This has been like the thing I've been most rejected for over and over and over consistently. Um, right. But it does, obviously that's the work that's needed to build a business, but I find that challenging. Um, the other thing that flipped in me compared to when I was working at um, a job before and then running your own business is when I was working before, if I had some work to do that like had to get done over the weekend, I would kind of be doing it like annoyed kind of on like late on a Sunday night, just like ready, just getting the bare amount done that I could. So Monday morning I was like all set up and it was always like, out of begrudgingly and you know working on it and just trying to get trying to get to the um ready for monday morning let's say but now i find the opposite problem where now i need to very consciously like take myself away from working because Mm. i would it's so easy and it's like such a joy for me to just keep working that i know i need to take breaks for myself but it's almost the opposite so where it was difficult for me to do work um, let's say kind of like overtime type work before now it's like I need to stop myself from doing that yes do you find the same yep abs- no that's I'm so glad you mentioned that I had a call with my dad yesterday or sorry um, two days ago and I'm just like hey dad I need some fatherly advice and he's probably listening hey dad <laughs> and I'm just like I'm having trouble not working yeah I I like working I think it's great but I'm having trouble just like focusing on something else because I'm having trouble um, experiencing pleasure without guilt because I know mm-hmm. that I could be doing some work instead. I could have sent another 10 emails. I could yeah. have recorded another video. I could have found another podcast guest. I could have done another talk. And at what point do you draw the line where it's yeah. like, okay, here's my work. Here's my private life, my yeah. personal life where I am, geez, expanding my mind in other ways. But it is addicting. Mm-hmm. That's a that's the self-employed story, though. Totally. Who are you gonna blame if you don't get you know ten clients this month? Mm-hmm. You're gonna blame Me. Kayla. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're gonna blame you. Also, Same like, here. Like you blame your yourself. Bank account look like like it becomes you and your livelihood. So yeah, um, yeah. I think your actions are so directly related to your outcomes, which maybe a lot of people are missing in their workplace that it does become addicting. And especially with sales and business development, like you can't finish there's it's unending. You can always do more. Yeah. Right. And it's a, it's a continuous cycle. Like, okay, Q one's done. Okay. Now here's (laughs) your quota for Q two. It's like, but I just finished Q one. What do you, can I celebrate for a second? Yeah. Um, it's so continuous, but we mentioned how, okay, your, your rewards are so not attached from your efforts in maybe an average workplace or you Mm -hmm. give the report to your manager and it disappears. Whereas for, for people who are self-employed, it's like, no, it's, it's difficult. But once you do see where your work goes and once you get that reward or that new client or hear that new testimonial, that feels so good. And that's totally. where maybe the, uh, I don't have to call it an addiction. I was but that's where say that addiction. <laughs> <laughs> the, the metaphor for me is like, okay, the only reason I golf is because out of a three hour game playing 18 holes, I'll have like two good shots, like really good shots. <laughs> that feels so good that that's enough to make me keep playing next year and the, the month after. All mm-hmm. you need is just like one good shot out of, 120 shots out of the round (laughs) if you're bad like me and it's same with like maybe running a business or doing these things it's like yes there's so much rejection there's so much failure there's so much learning and flipping your business upside down and kind of uh, um 
seeking new perspectives and new ideas and new marketing, how to reach new people. And then when it works just once, it's like, oh, the, the shoulders come down yeah. and you feel so good. Is that kind of the feeling you get when you, same with, with how you're running your business? Yeah, absolutely. And in our business, like, I think being able to employ some other people, so we have facilitators in different cities, is there's a lot of joy in that, I think, helping other people do, um, like, very talented facilitators who want to get into the corporate market but maybe weren't able to or didn't have the time to do it on their own. That's very rewarding. Uh, any feedback you get after a session, I would imagine you get this too, especially from kids, is really, really rewarding. And I, there's a part where it like kind of pulls at the heartstrings and, and that to me also is like, then that's, yeah, your shoulders come down and you're like, this is why I'm doing this. Now yes. I remember again. Yeah. A beautiful rem- a reminder. Yeah. yeah. That's, which is so needed. I think what's difficult about your business though, is it's so necessary and so awesome <laughs> that I think like when you when you people say no, it's like, what do you mean you say no? <laughs> like this is an awesome service. What are you talking about? Right? It's not like you're selling, you know, stickers here that aren't <laughs> necessary or selling new pencil sharpeners to offices. You're selling something so vital to the human soul. And it's it's just hard to ha- hear that no, because it's like, what do you mean? Totally. This this can help so this can help your employees, I promise. And we've talked about this too. It's so personal because early on, or if we're talking about um, keynote speaking, or it's when you're just working with yourself in your own time, early on when you're pitching programs or pitching your workshops or you're speaking, you're pitching yourself. So when they're not interested, it's not like they weren't interested in the widget that your company sells. They're like, we're not interested in you. We do not want to pay for this. (laughs) So I think for me, I do feel like, um, you know, these things take time. I do think people will come around and that, um, you know, we know that this business is expanding both of our businesses. And so, but yeah, it is hard to take that rejection. It's very personal. But also a great learning experience for rejection. It's very humbling. (laughs) It, It is. No, you're right. You're right. It's like not everyone... Um, is necessarily on my team totally which is a good it's a kind of a, a good experience to have if you succeed all just like any sport you learn more from a loss than you do a win right you can look to improve and how you're actually marketing yourself and and what's needed and what businesses actually want and need and but as far as holding your self-worth to your business that's where things get tangled with self-employment it's like okay Kayla I want you to come in but uh, the budget you proposed, we, we can pay half. And you're like, <laughs> exactly. what do you mean? I'm only worth half. <laughs> yeah. I'm only worth this much. I thought it was worth <laughs> this much. And then we were tying ourselves to like some monetary standard. I'm like, no, that's not right. A human being isn't worth, you know, money. Um, it's really tricky. Mm-hmm. Is, do, you, do you struggle with that sometimes mm-hmm. or have yourself dealing with those thoughts? A hundred percent. I think I'm, it's getting easier, but early on, yeah, everything was so personal. And I think too, early on, every um, gig you can get or any outreach, like it's so, you are so dependent on it that that's why the stakes are so much higher. Mm. Um, you reminded me, there's this really, really good um, clip from years ago and it's when Oprah was starting her talk show. I don't know if you've seen it like floating around. Um, I'll send it to you. It's so good. The interviewer is like asking her, you know, what if (laughs) he straight up says, what if your talk show doesn't succeed, which is a little aggressive, but she's like, well, I will still be successful because I'm not just my TV show. Mm. It's such a like power. uh, It's such a good clip. And she also says it's so old and it's like pre now knowing how successful she is and everything that she's done. She's like, that would be, she says something along the lines of like, it would be wonderful if I could be a talk show host. And you're really? like, you did a really good job of that. That's <laughs> like, you're like the best in the world. So. Whoa. so yeah, I think it's like having that confidence. And maybe if you don't have the confidence, like working on affirmations and visualization and just being like, I will succeed outside of this business or mm-hmm. this business can pivot and we can always 
make changes. That's right. been helpful. So when you go to Regina, um, Peak Wellness is still going to exist. You're going to do it there and then hopefully well, keep your facilitators in all different cities throughout Canada. Is that the plan? Yeah, you got it. So we have facilitators. Um, we're really well set up in Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Kelowna, New York. We're kicking off. And then I'll be running it out of Regina primarily. But yeah, there's so many talented facilitators all across North America. There's no shortage. Um, and so it's going to be a matter of working on business development, doing a lot of that side, and then hiring the best facilitators and, and getting them to these offices that's across incredible. North America. Yeah. And uh, it's tax season. Uh, that's another fun part of being <laughs> self-employed. I just thought of that. See, I was listening to you. I was so deeply. And then a thought came in. It's like, Scott, taxes. Because I saw my, my piece of paper on my, my taxes the HST. Are due too. Yeah, at the end of January. Yeah. So yeah. that's another fun part of being self-employed. Yeah, it's a it's crazy. I think, and I don't want to intimidate anyone from like building a business or starting this, but c- when you think maybe us business students take ourselves too seriously, but you graduate from business and you realize you know nothing about starting a business. <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess there's like some theories, but in terms of like for myself, accounting, even just like setting up your payroll and all that, you don't learn how to do that. And I found it particularly difficult to even like find information. Um, yeah. I found, this is always so shocking to me. Like, I guess I always just thought like accounting was very black and white. So like you would have this expense and you would be like, can I expense this? And I have a couple accountants who I rely on so much. Most of them are my friends and they don't want to be like my accountant at all. But I always <laughs> ask them these questions and I'll be like, can I expense this? Is this a business expense? And they'll be like, well, if you put it like this, it could be. Or like oh, if you, yeah. I just thought it was like black and white. Um, right. And so that has been a learning curve for sure. But I do think like you should never feel discouraged from that side of the business because you can always find people to help you or at the at the worst case scenario, you pay someone to do it for you. It shouldn't right. discourage you from building a business. But yeah, it's super confusing. It's confusing, <laughs> but so learning so much that... You can't learn in school. Totally. Or, I know, being forced to learn things is just such a backwards ideology. At school, like, you, yes, I chose a program. You chose a program to, to study. But, of course, there's courses in there that just don't don't really resonate with you. Mm-hmm. But you're forced to learn things. You're forced to do the exams. And it's just like when I graduated... I was so excited just to learn whatever I wanted finally. Mm -hmm. And when there was no pressure, no final exam, I could absorb information so much easier when it was something that I was really interested in. Uh, Did you find that going to school? Were you you interested in every single course? Because what was was your major? Um, We didn't actually major, so it was just business. Oh, business? Yeah. At community college? Uh, no, is that Western? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> like, maybe. I don't know. I know. It's kind of show. like... <laughs> I thought we were telling jokes. Western. What did you think of Western? I absolutely loved it. Okay. I was only there for a year and a half. Right. Um, I was a transfer student from Regina, so I obviously, like, it was so crazy to me. Um, it was, it seemed like out of like a movie, like movies you'd watch with like frat parties and stuff. I thought that just happened in movies. And then you go to Western and you're like, oh no, these happen like every weekend. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, but I did have a really good experience there. You did. Okay. Yeah. Was that a different Kayla, university <laughs> Kayla versus now? <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's, <laughs> it's so, in short, so different. Yeah. It's like we were saying this morning, like going out, like, I guess I say that with in quotations is so different now. And like what we want to do with our spare time is so different. But when we're in school, that was definitely the norm. Just going out was like a a constant. Um, And so things have changed for sure. I I don't go out like that anymore. That's not drinking is not really a 
much interest to me, but at Western, yeah, it's a it's a big part of their culture, I would say. Right, right. What so I was um speaking to my sister this morning and I bought flour and I have eggs and I'm gonna um try making my own pasta. I've never done that before. Mm -hmm. And um she has a pasta maker, but I saw how to make uh gnocchi too and you can do this different stuff with the rolling pin and I was like my emotions just ran a little high and I got really excited because I thought about <laughs> me going to Kitchen Stuff Plus and purchasing a, <laughs> and purchasing a um, rolling pin. And yeah. that got me excited. I was like, <laughs> what is my life now? Where buying uh, The thought of buying a rolling pin is, is, it made me really happy. I'm like, this is unbelievable. So I think personalities change. What excites us changes yeah. as we get older. <laughs> Um, do you like the way you've changed since university? Have you made a progression more towards your, your value system and what you, what you honestly think is important in life? I think so. Like I wouldn't take back those experiences in university, but when I had, um, like when I had a nervous breakdown, was, went to the hospital, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, was off work for a year, all that, that was all like pretty much right after university. And so although that was like very challenging when I look back now it's like I realized that I did there was a lot I didn't know about myself even in university even when you think like you're in university you think you're like old <laughs> and like wise I realized I mean in hindsight there was very little I knew about mental health in general um my mental health in particular different types of mental illnesses strategies for like coping and healthy um coping habits like I didn't know any of that stuff mm -hmm. and so I know we've joked about this before too it's like it's such a a, a privilege to have under to understand that better but the reason that we understand it better is because we just got like absolutely knocked to the ground earlier like right. just destroyed mentally and emotionally <laughs> and everything and so but would I take that back I don't think so because it's it's helped me learn who I am like at my core. And so when I look back even at like pictures and stuff from university, I was very happy. I was always like having a good time, but I realized I knew nothing about my mental health. Very interesting. So hopefully between you and I, we can help change that. So people, you know, you're in university, you still like have some basic knowledge and understanding around mental health. Cause mm -hmm. I guess I can only speak for myself. I just didn't have that. That's that's so great. And also, um, I guess, admirable to say that you wouldn't take it back. I always feel like if people don't regret and and like where they are in the present moment, then they can't regret where they've been and what they've done because it's brought you to this moment, which is so important um, to realize. I think I'd like to just ask you about when you say nervous breakdown, mm -hmm. Did this, so this happened after university. Did this happen at work? Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to let us in on, on, on that, uh, story? Cause that was a, and you, this diagnosis with bipolar, diagnosis, sorry, with bipolar disorder. This was a big, big, I guess, uh, p but pivotal moment into what led you to peak wellness. Totally. Yeah. And I think you're right. Every single thing that I experienced, even like, although it wasn't enjoyable in that time, has given me a perspective that I just didn't have. I couldn't mm -hmm. even access before this. So, yeah, I had a nervous breakdown, which is actually a clinical term. So if you're like, oh, I had a nervous breakdown because I like did poorly on this test, um, it actually has like kind of a clinical uh, meaning behind it. And so what my breakdown looked like... Um, Basically, I had been working for, I think, about six months. Pretty normal. Again, like super just normal life. Nothing really crazy ever happened. Went to school, graduated, started working. Um, and over a very short period, like an acute period of kind of like two, three weeks, my behavior started to become very odd and like um, just not like myself. But my office was probably they saw it the most like just be spending so much time at the office and them seeing um changes in my behavior so things such as like um for bipolar for mania it can be things like barely sleeping loss of appetite um 
your mind is just going like a mile a minute, even symptoms such as like cutting people off when they're speaking, um, really just feeling like out there, um, aspects of paranoia. It really all culminated in like this acute period of um, two weeks. And so although my friends were seeing a little bit of it because they didn't see me every day, I think they were kind of like, you know, that's a little weird, but like it wasn't a big red flag for them. Um, but yeah, I just was, was increasingly not sleeping, which affected everything else. And then my, just my understanding of the world just got super distorted all in like one day. So that's called psychosis. Um, and so that all culminated. I went to work that day, uh, you know, and there was just so, I would briefly spoken with my parents on the phone and they just could tell that something was like really out of whack like something just what I was saying just was barely making sense and Mm -hmm. so they actually called my office and they were like is Kayla at work today and what had happened is I had gone to work and I was like very distraught and they were like okay you should go home like take the day off like take however many days off you need like just let us know so I went home and then um, in that process, my parents called um, my office and then I ended up going back to the office and my parents had said to my boss at that time, like, we don't know what's going on, but if she, when she comes into work, like, take her to the hospital. Like, it was, it was very, very extreme, just the things I was thinking and saying. Um, and so that's exactly what happened. I came back to work. Um and I went to emergency with my boss. I was in the psych ward with my boss for hours and hours. And I was just extremely, extremely lucky that my employer was just every step of the way so supportive. And I know most people do not have that experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, even with their support and them holding the job for me while I was off work, I was off work almost double the amount of time I had worked there. So Mm -hmm. I worked there for like six months. I was off work for a year, got back to work full time. Their support was just incredible. Um, But I still had a lot of embarrassment about like what had happened at work, Mm -hmm. even though just a couple people saw it. It was so, that was the most vulnerable I've ever been in my entire life. So that took me a while to really work through. I'd say I'm still working through it um, because... Well, they understood that that was not me. That was not like my actions were not myself. I was um, quite literally psychotic. It still felt to me like I should have been in control of that situation and I wasn't. Right. Is that what makes it more, I guess, the healing process a little more difficult is thinking that you should have been in control but literally couldn't? Yeah, I find actually in my experience, and I have heard this from some other people as well with bipolar disorder, um, the depression is easier to like come to terms with for whatever reason. I think I felt, well, with the depression, I, I wasn't in any psychosis. So I was thinking straight, although I was depressed. Um, but the mania is really hard to come to terms with because you are not yourself. You are not in reality. You are not um thinking even you just become so detached and so another thing that I think makes it hard is like it's not like I like blacked out for that period like I remember it I remember going back to my office very well and then going to the hospital so I also can remember some of the thought patterns I was thinking during that and so that's really hard to come to terms with because you're like I remember why I said that thing now I have the perspective of knowing like why that was like extreme paranoia and psychosis but it doesn't necessarily make it easier because I felt like I should not have been acting that way Hmm. so I think mania it's a really weird weird um experience and I think um having now a network of people that I can kind of lean on and having had lots of conversations about mania with other people with bipolar disorder it's really really comforting because you realize your story is not unique people all around the world and historically um you know have had these experiences but yeah you're not in control I think that is a big factor that's that's a that's a comforting feeling 
a lot of people thinking that they're alone and then a quick google search you know totally. what i mean and to see all you know people continue to say we're not talking about mental health if you just look at the hundreds thousands of support groups mm -hmm. youtube channels videos resources online resources nonprofits charities thousands and thousands of advocates for any mental illness yeah. ever mm -hmm. there is so much conversation around that so if you feel alone my friends use your computer to your advantage and just and even just kayla speaking about her own personal experience you are definitely not alone in mm -hmm. this and there are people to connect with who can understand and empathize with what you're going through um on that note i'd like to ask politely if <laughs> okay. you would um be comfortable Please, everyone, if you're driving, just pay attention. Um, if you kind of like to lead us through a short little meditation, um, a meditation, how about a meditation for beginners? Okay. Um, maybe something something short that uh, people can use, obviously not while they're driving. Yes, this is not good for driving. <laughs> um, yeah, let's do it. Yeah? How okay. long? This is for, this is for me too, have? selfishly. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, what do you think for be what do you think three minutes i was gonna say like three okay? five minutes okay okay all right okay i'm choosing between a body scan and one i made up that doesn't really have a name oh the one you made up okay. for sure oh yeah <laughs> this is the the kalo original this one right um, here yeah this is funny i premiere i'm not sure if you get asked this as well but sometimes people will be like what type of meditation is this and because there's obviously so much history and so we our curriculum pulls from a, a couple different types but um you know if our if the meditation is about like how to like have a mindful coffee break and how to enjoy your coffee it's not from a specific lineage or you know right 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 <laughs> so a lot of these are more um like very very uh heavily guided as well as pretty literal so there's not a lot of like um visualization required that's kind of a hallmark of what we do for beginners that's so. i love that it doesn't need to fall into a, a box or a label it's just totally. right so th that's great i love that okay okay let's do it all right everyone uh if you're driving press pause now and then uh, listen <laughs> to this when you're home or in the morning or when you get to the office okay i am ready okay i actually do have a name for this one it's called taking up space so the taking up space meditation okay okay so if it's comfortable for you, I'd invite you to join me in closing your eyes, taking whatever posture is available to you right now, your feet on the ground if that's possible, and taking kind of just a, a little bit of an elevated posture, something we maybe call like a dignified posture, just sitting a little higher than normal. I invite you to think of now the space between your palms. So whether your palms are up, down, if your fingers are crossed, it doesn't matter. Just really focusing on that space, bringing your awareness there. And imagining that everything you are is in between your two palms. Like the smallest, the essence of you, as tightly wound up as possible. I invite you to now imagine that that small circle pops and becomes a little bit larger. So now the space around you, maybe a foot to your left, a foot to your right, all around you, just kind of like a little orb is you and your essence, your energy, your focus, everything that you are within this bubble. You can imagine what it might feel like to be sitting next to people or walking down the street, just feeling a little larger. We'll take a couple breaths, just feeling what it feels like to sit in this. Feeling just a little larger than we are. And just like before, we'll feel that bubble pop. And see now if you can visualize yourself fitting the entire room. So all your energy pushing to the ceilings, the walls. Really 
really filling the entire room with how you see yourself, you as a person, your energy. Feeling almost limitless in the space around you. We spend so much time trying to make ourselves smaller. Let's feel like what it feels like to take up space. We'll sit in this for just a couple breaths. Now bringing all your concentration to how you filled this room. You can feel kind of your energy and awareness shooting out of every part of your body. And let's imagine now that that breaks through the windows, knocks down the doors, goes all the way out to the hallway, onto the street, as far as you can imagine. As far as that awareness is available to you. You might feel like this is taking up a couple blocks, maybe an entire city, a province, a state. This space is 100% yours as far as you can imagine, as far as you can visualize. And we'll sit through a few breaths here. Just feeling what it feels like to take up space. We can imagine with this visualization just how many people we interact with. If we're covering an entire city, the number of people that we're reaching, the interconnectivity. Feeling the comfort of community, what it feels like to interact with those around you. I'll ask you to call to mind just how we started this meditation, that space between the palms when we felt small and tiny and condensed, and comparing that feeling now to what it feels like to fill the room, the hallway, the streets, the city, taking up space. You might find it helpful to roll your shoulders up to your ears now and down your back. Try to carry this feeling with you today, wherever you go. When it's comfortable for you, I invite you to blink your eyes back open and into the room. There you go. (laughs) And on that note, I feel very... Big. large <laughs> good in a very good way um on that note i'd like to thank kayla for coming on the podcast kayla any last messages that you'd like to um uh you know send the send the audience also how can we find you sure so you can find us online we are peak I listed a couple of cities that we're working in right now but we are growing and so if this feels like something you'd want to bring to your workplace or your community space, um, that's where you find us. On Instagram, we're also Peak Wellness Co. And any final messages for the listeners? Um, no, I hope this is, I hope this is um, helpful. And hopefully by sharing some of my experience, you might feel a little less alone and know that there's tons and tons of people like us out there um and you know by following the stuff the work that scott's doing i think you do a really good job of highlighting that so thank you thank you so much kayla thanks everyone stay strong keep being you express yourself and uh try a little bit of meditation here and there bye-bye